In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Good morning. Welcome. There are two uh, people or two families, and each have their own home. These houses are essentially the same. They're built on foundation with a basement. They have a wood frame structure and everything that somebody would want in a house, a living room, a kitchen, a dining room, family room, several bedrooms and bathrooms. The homes are unique in that they have a different shape and size. One is a one-story ranch, the other a two-story colonial. One has a lot of square footage, the other not so much. However, when you enter inside of these two different homes, it's as if they existed on two different planets. One home is beautifully appointed with paint colors that blend nicely together, accented by elegant window treatments. The furniture is thoughtfully chosen and arranged for each room. And the walls have carefully selected hangings, portraits, paintings, and other meaningful art. Most importantly, the home is clean and well-maintained. Nothing is broken or falling apart. The other home, however, is a hodgepodge of different colors that clash. Furniture is ill-chosen and arranged so that one room is difficult to navigate while another looks like it's vacant. One room is full of heavy drapes, creating a dark cave effect while another room has nothing at all on the windows as if it had been long ago abandoned. Worst of all, everything is dirty and worn out. The ceilings and walls have peeling paint or damage never repaired. Some rooms look like a hoarder's heaven. If somebody asked why the difference, what might you say? Maybe they have different tastes or preferences. Maybe they have different incomes. Maybe they have different values. In today's epistle reading from the 17th Sunday, St. Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, he speaks about a different type of home. He says, we are the temple of the living God. In other words, our body our mind, our heart, our soul are a home, a dwelling place for the eternal triune God. St. Paul emphasizes this point by quoting several Old Testament passages. I will live in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, if God lives in each one of us, how are we arranging the furniture and decorating the place? In other words, is our home for God beautifully adorned with virtues, or is it cluttered with unseemly passions? Do I have a sofa of welcoming hospitality to the Lord? Or do I have a couch of isolation? Do I have a dining table of fasting and feasting? Or do I just have a platform for gluttony? Do I have a chair and a lamp for reflective and meditative reading? Or do I have a beanbag of slothfulness? Do I have a symphony of peace playing on the radio of my soul? or rather a cacophony of angry, bitter, and resentful voices? Is my mind full of icons of Christ, the Virgin Mary, and the saints? Or is it crowded with lustful, tawdry images from my TV, my computer, or my smartphone? Is my heart simple and satisfied? Or am I looking out the window at other people's homes, desiring more and more of what I don't have that will never fulfill the bottomless void? 
Do I have a bed to rest on? Or am I constantly running around wearing out the carpet under my feet? Am I grateful for whatever humble abode God has given me? Or am I trying to pridefully outdo everyone else so that I can feel better about myself? St. Paul makes a connection between the contents of our body, our mind, our soul, and our heart, and with what we believe and what we practice on the outside. In other words, what is inside of us is determined a great deal by what we surround ourselves with. He says in the first words of today's epistle reading, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? In the next verse, he quotes again from the Old Testament. He says, therefore, come out from them and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch nothing unclean. Then I will welcome you. The idols of antiquity were man-made forms and images that people worshipped as gods and deities. A prime example would be the golden calf that the Israelites made shortly after Moses led them out of slavery in Egypt. The Ashtaroths and the other figurines would be other examples, little handheld statues, if you will. Even more concerning than the forms themselves would be the idolatrous practices of child sacrifice and cultic prostitution. When St. Paul says, be separate from them, he means get away from them and don't associate with the ancient Gentile people who practice such things. Now, some may say, we present-day Americans and Christians are nothing like the ancient pagans. But we should think about that some more. We may not have a little Buddha statue or an Indian totem in our home, but we might reverence our car or our house more than God. We may not sacrifice our children as part of an overt religious practice to appease some angry God, but we know that nearly one million babies are aborted, literally sacrificed on the altar of convenience every year. And how many millions more children are offered up by their parents to the God of sports and athletics? We certainly do not practice prostitution as part of our worship rituals, but how many people are caught in the web of pornography as an attempt for ecstatic experience? A few years back, atheists were using cute pictures of babies on billboards to spread their message. One said, we are all born without belief in gods. Learn how to be a born-again atheist. Another billboard read, please, it's a little baby, please don't indoctrinate me with religion. Teach me to think for myself. Now, these are almost laughable, but sadly, they show the fight that we Christians, and especially Orthodox Christians, are up against in society. According to our own church teaching, we are all born with an innate desire to believe in something greater than ourselves. Call it the gift of faith. The question is, what are we believing in? Cars, money, power, trees, government, celebrities, athletes, or the one true, eternal God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, as we know, is our Father as well. And we should be trying to indoctrinate our children to do the same. That doesn't mean we're going to, we're not going to teach them to think for themselves. The atheists mistakenly believe that virtues and inner beauty 
that can be attained by each person somehow come from a vacuum of existence. They forget that the very values that are the foundation of being healthy human beings in healthy families, in a healthy society, come from the religion as revealed by God, the God of Israel, to his chosen people, we Christians being the inheritors. My brothers and sisters, listen to what King David wrote in Psalm 115. It talks about idolatry and how it can affect us. Quote, why should the Gentiles say, so where is their God? But our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of people's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes they have, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Noses they have, but they do not smell. They have hands, but they do not handle. Feet they have, but they do not walk nor do they mutter through their throat. Those who make them are like them, and so is everyone who trusts in them. I'll say the last sentence again. Those who make them are like them, and so is everyone who trusts in them. St. Paul closes today's epistle with another quotation from the Old Testament, and I already talked to the kids about this. It's a quote from the prophet Samuel, and it says, I will be your father, and you shall be my sons and daughters. And St. Paul goes on to add, since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, making holiness perfect in the fear of God. So let us clean our house because we have a very special guest who wants not to just visit us, but to move in and take up residence in our body, to be seated on the throne of our heart, to occupy our mind, to dwell in our soul. Let us welcome Christ as God to live in us forever and ever. Amen.